church. It is so good to be with you guys today. We are excited for this morning, and we are excited that we get to worship together. Would you stand with us as we sing today? the shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near I will fear no Out here, 
you are working in our way you're sanctifying us we're beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust in your plan you quit to steal the prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are with who could understand your ways bringing high above the heavens reaching down in endless grace you're the lifter This is our mighty life. Your claims are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever. Even what, even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Is it happy 4th of July? Merry 4th of July? Happy? Okay, happy 4th of July. So I'd like all these blue-shirted people up here to hold up their hands like that, both hands. How many fingers do you have? 
How many fingers are you going to have next week when you come back? Everybody have at least 10, okay? No fireworks problems tonight, okay? And all you adults, too. Probably have to worry about all you guys out there more than them. Um, I want to welcome you all here this morning. Um, thankful that uh, we're able to worship freely, and that's one of the beauties of our country. Uh, and I think that's what we celebrate on the 4th of July in reality. I do want to put a shout out in the, in the uh, yellow insert on the back page. There's information about the business meeting coming up on the 18th of this month. And um, if you're a member, certainly would, we'd expect you to attend uh, as a voting member. However, if you're not a member, we still would like you to attend. There's a lot of stuff going on, uh, introducing a new interim pastor starting in the fall. Uh, other things that are going on, and so we just want to be able to communicate through that business meeting to everybody that's uh, either a member or a regular attender, and so we just encourage everyone to show up for that. There will not be any Sunday school that morning. There will just be, be the business meeting at 9 o'clock during the normal church service, so we'll just be having one actual service that Sunday. Um, I was supposed, I was given a note to have the kids that are children's church age be dismissed after this, but I thought, what better way to get them to want to be part of the kids' camp in a year or two? So I'm going to say that maybe the kids that would normally go to uh, children's church should stick around till Bethany's uh, kids are done, and then they could be dismissed. Um, so I don't have any other announcements, and um, so I will close in prayer, or we'll continue in prayer, and then we'll have Bethany come up. Sorry, dropping everything. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for uh, who you are, uh, the many freedoms you've given us as being Americans. Um, I pray that we don't take that for granted on a day like today as we um, celebrate with our family and friends. And uh, so, God, I just thank you for uh, the many freedoms we do have, particularly the, able, the ability to come here and worship freely. And, God, I just uh, thank you for... Um, the chance we had to send the kids to uh, kids camp this last week. Thank you for their safety. Uh, thank you for the fellowship that they had. Most of God, just thank you that they're able to get together and um, just have a fun time um, and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So simple, faith like a child. I give you an inch and you take me a mile. I feel the wind rush and the thunder roll. Two feet on the water, only one way to go. Yeah. I don't gotta be afraid no more, no. Cause I know you up through the storm. I'm more than just a talker. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a,
As you can tell by those pictures, we had a blast at kids camp. Um, we went for two days, and I think we totaled like 700 pictures in the Google Photos album that we had made. So we had a ton of fun, um, from zip line to water balloon dodgeball to catching the tiniest, tiniest fish ever, um, to push-ups for lost and found. And I'll plug this now. If you think you lost something, there is some stuff out there. So I won't make you do push-ups for it right now. <laughs> or sing or dance, but there is some stuff. So make sure parents, you look at that just before you leave. Um, but no, we had an awesome time, but I'd rather have you hear it from them than just me. So unless you are Christy, Abby, or Kendall, come on up here and um, come share with us. Just form like some sort of a line-ish. No one wants to go first. They're all crowding toward the middle. <laughs> Come on, Kelvin, move on down. Move down, move down. 
All right, so I'm going to have them share their name, um, whether they were a leader or not, but I'm pretty sure you can tell. Um, and um, maybe something that they learned from the trip. So, Kelvin, you want to start? Yeah. Okay. My name is Kelvin, and my favorite part of camp was probably hanging out with the kids, the other kids in my cabin, and the kids like around the Gaga ball pit because everyone was there most of the time. Um, hi, my name is Ian Patterson. One of my favorite parts was Gaga ball. And one thing I learned not to do was not to do a belly flop off of the high dive. <laughs> Hi, my name is Caleb, and my favorite part was the zip line. Um, hi, my name is Levi. Um, my favorite part of camp was probably zip line. And um, one thing I learned, don't lose a bunch of things because you have to sing and dance. <laughs> my, my name is Jaden Broughton. Um, my favorite thing was gaga ball, and something I learned not to do was not to do a front flip off of the high dive. Hi, my name is Lily Wright, and um, my favorite part was when Bethany came in with the megaphone, but the grace cabin was already up. Hi, I'm Taryn Marsman, and this is my first year as a junior leader, and it was really fun. It's definitely, a, like, you see it from a different perspective from a student to a leader, and I don't really have a favorite part but I like hanging out with the girls in my cabin. I'm Taylor Erfmeyer, and this is my second year as a junior leader. And I think it was just awesome to see the kids grow closer to God and have a good time with each other. Hi, my name is Clara, and my favorite part was the zip line and hanging out with my cabin. Hi, my name is Neil Van Ryswick. This was my first year as a junior leader, and it is way different than <laughs> being a student. <laughs> the perspective is way different. Um, my favorite part was probably archery tag. Um, hello, my name is Claire Patterson. This was also my first year as a junior counselor, and we talked a lot about faith this week, and so one of the choice times I decided to do was high ropes, and it it's a lot higher when you're up there than when you're on the ground. <laughs> um, so, like, I was, like, the last in line, and all these, like, younger kids were, like, going, like, no problem. And I'm like, okay, if they can do this, I can do this. So that was just, like, one of the times I had to have faith this week. I'm Dylan May, and this was my first time as a junior leader. And, it, like they said, it's way different as a junior leader than a kid. But I just really like being there for the kids instead of being a kid. And I thought it was really cool to watch the kids grow. You guys can go sit with your families. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we had a ton of fun. Um, yeah, I'll just share the story. Anytime that a kid lost an item, um, they would either have to do push-ups or sing and dance for everybody. And the first night, Levi Luce lost four things. So while everybody else just had to do 10 push-ups, Levi had to sing and dance Baby Shark for everybody. So yeah, we had a lot of push-ups. A lot of working out happened while we were at camp this week. Um, so our theme for the week, as you can tell by our shirts, was Faith Hall of Fame. Um, and this week, we really focused on the word faith. This is a word that these kids hear all the time. Um, but what does it actually mean? So we talked about what the definition of faith is and um, how they can apply that and the importance to their lives. Um, so we studied Hebrews 11, and through that we had a, a lot of really awesome conversations. We had nine kids get saved on this trip, which is awesome. Yeah. I spent that night in my cabin, like, crying, like, this is so cool. Um, so to share a little bit about the conversations and some spiritual growth that happened, I'm going to call Christy May and Abby May and Kendall Luce up to share some stories about that. Who wants to start? You guys want to start? Yes. Um, this was my last year going to kids camp, and it was really cool because I had um, an opportunity this year to help somebody in my cabin spiritually. She asked a lot of questions about it, and then on Thursday night, she 
um, decided to be saved. Um, this was my last year at camp, and one of the girls in my cabin, she decided that she wanted to be saved. So right after we went to chapel, we got in the cabin, and she asked our leaders if how she could be saved, and she got saved. So that was really cool for me. So I realized this year that I am now the oldest counselor, <laughs> which I don't feel like I should be at that point already, but here I am. So um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, this week was, well, week, two days, three days, was pretty amazing. Um, I think Peter Contola said it best at the end when he said, what a privilege this was. And I agree. It's a privilege um, to be able to take this many kids to a camp where we get to freely talk about Jesus and worship him. Um, it's a privilege to be able to go with all these kids that I see on a daily basis through my job or through church. Um, it was a privilege to uh, watch my own kids be there as kids and junior counselors. My nieces and nephews, my in-laws, my everyone, my family was there. What a privilege it is to go to a church where we all get to focus on God in the same way. Um, so in my cabin, I had the littles, the little girls, and um, some of them, it was their first time ever to be away from mom and dad other than maybe spend the night at grandpa and grandma's house. And I think it was obviously a godsend that I was their teacher and so in school, and they were very familiar with me. So they weren't, they weren't nervous. They were happy and fun. I mean, there was a couple times they may have said, oh, I miss my mom or dad. They came and got a quick hug. And that was it. They were off and running again, and it was great. Um, I had three girls who right off the bat wanted to ask the Lord to be their Savior. And I was like, okay, that's awesome, but let's slow down a little bit. I want to make sure you really understand what that's all about. And so I made them wait. I said, we'll do it the next night. And um, I said, make sure you listen when Bethany talks, which, by the way, she is phenomenal in this position. I'm not just saying that. She was made for this. It's her God-given gift. So my three little girls listened to her messages. We talked at um, devotional time, and we discussed it even more in depth, exactly what it meant to ask the Lord to be your Savior. Um, I had to find a good way to explain it to them where it wasn't just, hey, you get to go to heaven when Jesus is your Savior, because it's so much more than that. And uh, my devotions that day go figure, we're on Romans 8, 5, where it talks about how when you're of the flesh, you have no choice but to do the things that the flesh desires. But once you have Jesus in your heart, then you have a choice, and you get to choose to do the things that God and Jesus want you to do to be more like him. What a great way to explain it to my girls. So we talked about things like how... Um, when you're mad at your brother, you have a choice. How are you going to handle it? Are you going to yell at them and scream at them and be mad? Or are you going to forgive them and realize you do things wrong too? When your parents want you to do something like clean your room, you have a choice. Do you obey your parents because that's what God wants you to do? Or do you avoid it? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, so... The girls listened to all these messages from me, from Bethany, from all the activities we're doing. And then the next night, it was time. And so I went through the ABCs of salvation, as Bethany had all set up for us. And I said, OK, if you girls are still ready, we can do this. Not only did those three girls still want to do it, but so did their two other cabin mates. So out of the seven girls in my cabin, two had already been saved. Three wanted to do it right away and the other two joined them by the end. So the entire cabin was saved by the end. So. And I just want to say that is not a testament to me by any means. That is a testament to the parents who raised those kids, to the Awana, to the Sunday school, to the church people that surround these kids each and every day. So kudos to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Seriously, the way that God worked through this camp is so cool to see. On Sunday at our leaders meeting, I think we had a 60 and 70 percent chance of rain for the two days. And I told all the leaders, pack a rain poncho, pack an umbrella, but just pray that it goes away. And then that morning or the next morning, Kylie Sherman texted me a picture of the forecast and it was zero percent chance of rain. 
So just so cool and awesome to see God work, not um, just within these kids, but within every part of the camp. Like he was just there and that was amazing to see. Um, I have some thank yous to give out before I hand um, over to Doug, but um, one to the leaders. I could not have done any of this without them, so I'm going to shout all of them out really quick. Jen and Betsy for doing craft. Actually, stand up when I say your name. So Jen and Betsy. Um, Debbie May and Penny Sherman for coming to help cook. Dave Sherman for coming to help set up games. And then for our boy leaders, we had Caleb McCullough, Pete Cantola, and Adam Sherman. Um, for our boy junior leaders, we had Neil Van Ryswick, Josiah Cantola, and Dylan May. For our girl leaders, we had um, Christy May, Kylie Sherman, and Brianna McFerrin. And then for our girl junior leaders, we had Taylor Erfmeyer, Taryn Marsman, and Claire Patterson. Seriously, could not have done this without any of you guys and your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Please come back. Um, and then second, to the parents, thank you so much for sending your kids. Um, this obviously wouldn't be possible without any of you trusting me and trusting every other leader um, that came with us. We had a blast with them. Um, we had an amazing group of 45 kids who signed up for camp this year. Um, it was awesome. So thank you so much for just trusting us and sending your kids um, to learn about Jesus. It was so fun. And then um, to everybody else for the church, just for praying for us. Um, like we said, it was an amazing few days of spiritual growth, just of fun. And it was so cool to be able to give these kids normalcy again. Um, and for them to just be able to hang out with their friends with no restrictions, nothing like that. Um, and they had a blast. So thank you so much for praying. Um, like I said, we saw God working in so many ways, and that wouldn't have been possible without you guys praying for us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That's all I have. So until next year. <laughs> on, right? Good. And thank you for putting the clock up there for me. Thank you so much. I don't mind being here till one o'clock, but the people sitting there might get a little weary of this. So, hey, I got to tell you, this is a 10-year-old statistic, but uh, last I knew, 10 years ago, the stat was that uh, of missionaries and pastors, I'll just say people in full-time Christian service, 70% of them say they made some sort of decision for Christ and for full-time service going to either a church camp or a weekend retreat. Just want you to know that, how important this is. I mean, you know, Christy talks about her whole cabin became believers before the week was out. You just think about the fact that 70% of them out there who are serving Christ full-time made the decision on a week like your kids just had. This is very strategic, it really is. I was a youth pastor for 11 years, and uh, I remember saying, basically, I've been demoted becoming a senior pastor because I work with a bunch of broken bricks. Prior to that, I was working with wet cement kids, and you can shape their lives. You really can. And uh, minimal results, it seems, with adults compared to what you can do in the life of a kid. So... It is good to be with all of you again here at Ravana. What a strange feeling to be back after all these years. It seems so strange. Some guy said, I heard one woman introduce me to somebody else, and a person saw that and said, you're Doug Bitework. I knew Doug Bitework. And I said, things change, lady, you know? <laughs> good grief. I tell you what. I have come from mayhem and confusion because at my house all my grandkids came home from Chicago and elsewhere, and uh, so our house was filled with kids and grandkids, and we'll be so through tonight and tomorrow morning, and uh, it is nothing short of fun. Come to our house and you'll look at it, and it looks like the house threw up on itself. <laughs> the place is a mess. I left the house early this morning and came back and I looked at the front lawn there with bicycles laying on it and kayaks and paddles and all that stuff. 
And I thought, man, this place is a wreck. And I thought, what a beautiful thing. It really is. However, it's only for a while. <laughs> it makes me think of that poem I heard years ago that an old guy said. He said, I've seen the lights of London. I've seen the lights of Rome. But none so exciting as my son-in-law's taillights when they all go home. <laughs> And uh, I, I think you can share that sentiment, you know? They're like fresh fish, good for a couple days and then they stink. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> go back to Chicago or wherever you're from and we'll look forward to seeing you for the next holiday. So I also want to make a comment on the way people dress around here. The guy's coming up on the platform wearing shorts. What courage. The last time I wore shorts to a church service, a guy looked at me and he said, are those shorts or did you ride in here on a chicken? And I just decided, okay, I'm not wearing shorts anymore to church, but uh, nice to see the informal dress. It is a delight to take you into the Word of God. It really is. It's a big treat for me. And so um, let me uh, take you to the Word. But before I do, let's pray together, okay? Bow with me if you would. Every time we open this book, Lord, we just want to declare before all listening before the demonic realm and before the angelic realm, that this is holy writ. We believe it to be a holy writ, and we take it as perfect and entire and making a difference in our lives. Thank you for the fact that it has such relevance, written thousands of years ago, but here we are in the year 2021, and it plays right into our lives beautifully. Thank you for the relevance that it has. And so now, Holy Spirit, we just humbly ask you, to open up our eyes, just open up our eyes to what is here before us so we can see the truth that you want us to, to grasp here today. Bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ through this time, and thank you for this time that we have before us, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Years ago, my wife and I lived in Rockford, and we lived in an older home that was on Ten Mile Road, and it was right at the mouth of a large housing development of newer homes. And we had a paper boy by the name of Derek. And Derek did the paper out for the entire subdivision there, and uh, we were the last house on his route, and we felt it plenty. Because what he would do, his job or his mission that he was given, is basically throw the paper up on our front porch. That's all he had to do. We, we had one of these turn-of-the-century old homes that had a wraparound porch. And so, rather simple, huge porch. He just threw the paper up there. But I would find the paper in the ditch. I would find it blown across the front lawn. I'd see it in the slush in the driveway, laying out in the rain. I got so sick of finding that paper here and there that, you know, I would just keep chiding Derek, hey, Derek, come on, man, please, get on task here. Get the paper up on my porch so it's not wet. One day my wife saw me laying out this wet newspaper. I was desperate to see this one article, and she said, what's this? I said, the product of Derek. It's just a mess. You know, it's wet. I'm trying to see this. Finally, one day I said to Derek, I said, hey, let's, um, let's make a deal, you and me, okay? Here's the deal. When you come to collect... I will pay you for every single paper that I find on my front porch. Any paper that didn't make it to the front porch, you don't get paid for. Okay? So I just want you to know there's some consequences here. You're my paper boy. You will always be my paper boy. I didn't want him to lose his job or anything. I wasn't going to call in and complain. I just kept dealing with him. You will always be my paper boy. But I want you to know there will be consequences when you don't get it up on the front porch. He started to bat about 500 after that. On one occasion, I saw his dad delivering our paper. I was almost embarrassed and, and felt bad for the guy covering for his kid. And the whole thing just reminded me so much of God's relationship with Israel, interestingly enough. He said, you're my people. You will always be my people. And he said, and as long as you obey me and serve me as God, I will always keep you in the land and you'll live long in the land that the Lord your God gives you. You're going to be able to live in this land that flows with milk and honey. However, you go a-whoring after other gods, and that was the language that was used. You go after other gods, and I will scatter you to the north and to the south and the east and the west. And God did that over and over again. Scriptures replete with stories of how Israel blew it, and then God would just take them off into exile, exile, and then they would cry out, and God would bring them back. 
Look with me at a passage that takes us to that, and it's Psalm 107. And I'm going to be skipping around quite a bit in Psalm 107. But what I want you to see is I want you to see more than the individual verses, but I would like you to see is the pattern. The pattern of what is taking place here, that uh, Israel serves God, they fall away, and, and they cry out, then God brings them back, and then they rebel again, and on and on. And this psalm lays that out. And there's one single theme I would like you to pull from that psalm, and actually it's the theme, I, the theme I'd like you to pick up for this morning. Look at Psalm 107, beginning with verse 1. He says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. By the way, the word redeemed would imply that they've been gone somewhere and they've been pulled back, okay? So let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the hands from the, the lands from the east and the west and from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no city to dwell in where they could settle. Dropping down to verse 6, it says, Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distresses. I have written in my margin there that they turned to God. Dropping down to verse, uh, verse 10, it said, Some sat in darkness and in the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God. I have in my margin there, they got in trouble with God. But then drop down to verse 13. They turned back to God. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. Verse 15 says, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and for his wonderful deeds for men. And then it goes on to say in verse 17, Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near to the gates of death. Then what did they do? They cry out. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distresses. Let them give thanks to the Lord. Verse 23 Others went out on the sea in ships, and they were, in merchants. they were merchants on the mighty waters, and they saw the works of the Lord, the wonderful works, or wonderful deeds of the deep. For he spoke and stirred up the tempest and lifted up the high waves. And verse 27 says, they reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits' end. In verse 28, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. If you don't get anything out of that song but this, understand this that God loves us and wants us back. He wants us back and he goes after us over and over and over again. And this psalm is replete with illustrations of that where there's disobedience, they get the consequences of their disobedience, they cry out and God restores them. And then the whole scenario repeats again and again and again. It's really anecdotally laying out what the, we as Christians do, right? How many here became a believer and fell away? Perfect, two of you. Okay. No, there was really a whole bunch of you that raised your hands because there's a lot of us that we accept Christ and we just kind of back away. I, um, when we um, bought the house we're living in right now, it was just shy of 20 years ago, and uh, I remember the realtor driving up to show it to us, and he had a woman with him, and uh, Anyway, she sat in the car as he took us through the house, and, and uh, we ended up buying the place. But, but anyway, um, I said, who's the lady in the car? He said, well, that's my wife with our firstborn son who was born six days ago in the newborn infant laying in her arms. Well, I met them. Turns out they are believers. They ultimately started coming to our church, actually. And, uh, and their son, his name is Max. Well, okay, so that dates Max for me. I knew him at his birth almost 20 years ago. Just a few weeks ago, I saw them, and they have since moved on, and I've retired, and, and so I haven't seen him in quite a while. And I said, so how's Max doing? And they said, he's doing terrible. He's doing just absolutely awful. He spent one year in college, and he came home, and he knows it all. We're just stupid parents. And they hate, he hates us, and he says it. I hate you. He eats our food. He lives in our house. But he says he hates us, and he hates God. And that's when I got excited for the first time in the conversation. I thought, oh, good. I even said it, oh, good. You know, good? 
I said, yeah, because, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, they lose interest in spiritual things, and you say, so are, are you going to church anymore or anything? And, no, no, I, I don't know, I just don't have time, and, you know, they're not really vehement about it. But when somebody says they hate God, that means that they're feeling some degree of conviction. You know, they just can't rest, and so they got to say, I hate you, and I hate your God, and, and that's what Max has been saying. And so the hound of heaven as he has been called, is after him. And I said to my wife, I said, you know, he might be the next Billy Graham. We need another Billy Graham, and it could be that Max is going to be it as he is vehemently running from God. Max could fit into Psalm 107 here very easily as somebody who's reeling back and forth like a drunk, <laughs> literally as a drunk sometimes. But, uh, but more than that, for all the times that he is, he is just rebelling from God and, and things are caving in on him. I'm looking forward to the day that I hear that Max falls on his face before God and says, okay, I give up. Please take me back. And what's so beautiful about our God, and this is where I want to turn this message, our God loves to take us back. He's all about it, isn't he? You know, you hear a lot of people talking about judgment and so forth, but we need to hold on to the fact that, that we've got a God that is there who is saying, I'm waiting for you with open arms anytime you want to come back. And so there's disobedience, there's consequences, and God does bring consequences on all of us. But I got to tell you, over and over again, as we turn to him, he is right there and takes us back over and over again. I'm looking forward to the day that Max comes back. Now, um, Despite their failures, God takes them back, and, um, and that's true of us. And so what I would like to do is I would like to talk to you a little bit about the love of God, if I could. How much he loves us. This psalm lays it out very clearly. Just the pattern of what God does there lets you know, wow, what a loving God. He never gives up on us. Wow. But turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. And you've got to be saying right now, oh, no, Zephaniah. Where in the Sam Hill is that? Go to the index of your Bible. It'll help you greatly. It's toward the end, though. It's right, it's just a couple books away from the Italian prophet Malachi, okay? <laughs> or is that Malachi? Whatever. Malachi back there. Just back up a few books and, and you'll come to Zephaniah. Not to be confused with Zechariah, okay? We're looking for Zeph, P-H, okay? Zephaniah, chapter 3, if you would. Chapter 3, verse 17. And I go to this verse because of the fact that it gets more specific about the love of God. The love that God has for each one of us. And it really lays it out in four points. Point by point. Four of them there that talks about the love of God. And so, let me be... Oh, yeah, let me find it and come to it. Yeah. So here it is. Verse 17 of Zephaniah 3. It says, The Lord your God is... And note these words with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great, you might underline this word, delight in you. Thirdly, he will quiet you with his love, and he'll rejoice over you with singing. Wow. That lays it out really clearly. And it's easy to blow by those words, and so in the balance of the time that we have before us, let me just talk to you briefly, if I could about what each of these things mean and the implications. And the fact that God is with us. We are never alone. He never leaves us. We um, used to go on family vacation with all four of our kids, and um, one of our children had this propensity for wandering off. Anybody here have a kid like that? Ah, perfect, two of you. Okay. Um, hordes of you. There's always that one kid, and we had that kid in our family, and I won't tell you which one, but his initials are Joshua. And, uh, <laughs> and he was always, always checking out this or that, and it just became so irritating. And uh, I, just, I just about lost it one day. Here we are at Yellowstone National Park, and uh, we're there at Old Faithful. How many have been to Old Faithful, by the way? Yeah, a bunch of you. Okay. So what is that, like 3.15 or something every day the geyser goes off? And there's somewhere between 100 or 150 people sometimes that gather in a great big circle around that, eagerly anticipating the geyser going off. And so here we are, and all of a sudden, where the fat is Joshua? Ah, ah. And then I look across, there he is. 
I thought, if I could wring your neck from here, I'd do it, kid. Oh, I was so provoked with that child. So anyway, he's like five or six, or 16 or 18, I don't know. Um, anyway, I thought, you know, I want this kid to feel his pain a little bit. And so I'm, I'm going to punish him. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to let him feel the aloneness. So I went around the circle. I didn't let him see me do this, but I got within reach of him, but I didn't want him to see me. And so 315 or whatever it is, the geyser goes off. Wow, everybody is, whoa. And I see his little lips going, wow. You know, he's excited with everybody else. It was fun. Then the geyser starts to subside, goes back down. And of course, the crowd dissipates. People are all moving away. And Joshua goes, wow, that was cool. Mom, dad, dad, mom, mom, dad, dad, mom, mom. And I grabbed him by the shoulders and I said, I'm right here. I won't tell you the rest of the discourse I had with that kid, but, <laughs> but he was greatly relieved to feel those big hands and that shadow fall over him and that voice that said, I'm right here. Isn't that a great picture of our relationship to God? We're like silly children wandering off foolishly not understanding the perils that are out there. We go off in our own direction and and then all of a sudden we're feeling all alone and quite far from God. And then he grabs us and says, I'm right here. That's what this verse is getting at. It's saying he is with you. The Lord your God is with you. And over and over again, you're going to feel the Holy Spirit in your life communicate to you in one way or another that you're not alone. God is here. I love you. I'll never leave you. I don't care what one of my kids would do. I would never abandon one of my children. Kill him, tie him to the, uh, to the barn door and, and horse whip him, you know, whatever, but I would never abandon him. Just kidding, okay? I would never leave my kids. And God would never leave his children, the children of Israel. And I'm here to tell you, church, he won't leave you. And you may think at different times in your life that God is done with you. He's never done with you. I don't know who it was. I can't remember. I think it was Spurgeon. I could be wrong. But he was the one that called God the hound of heaven, who's after us, who won't let us go, who pursues us. You had some songs here today that kind of allude to that. I love those songs that he'll never let go. He never lets go. He's there. He's there. He's on it. He's, he's with us. He wants us desperately. Well, it goes on, and we've got to move on, or we'll be here all day. And they have the time up there, so I do have a restriction on me finally. He goes on to say, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. Secondly, he will take great delight in you. I have written in my margin there. I write in my Bible all the time. I hope you do too. Just, just write all over it, okay? My wife does that, and she's got so many markings and her Bible is falling apart. I finally took it to a book bindery and had a rebound for her because she just never wanted a new Bible because how do I transfer all these notes? And, and so I spent a gazillion dollars to have her Bible rebound. She loved that and loved me for that. And uh, do that right in your Bible, if you would. Circle that word delight, and then right in the margin, he celebrates us. In other words, he looks at you, and he is excited about you. He likes you. And you think, really? Now, theologically, because of the fact that you're a bunch of Baptists, and you're correct in your theology, and there's a number of you who are Reformed, that's okay. I was raised Christian Reform. I know what your roots are. We we'll call us double dippers. You know, I was sprinkled, and they dunked me besides. But anyway... Uh, for all of us double dippers and for those of you who are single dippers, the truth of the matter here today is we understand theologically God loves us. We get that and we buy it. But we don't necessarily feel like God likes us. My experience with people through the last 41 years of being a pastor and even now my years of going back and forth to Mexico and dealing with a plethora of pastors and churches down there is that generally speaking, people feel like they're a terrible disappointment to God. And while he loves me, he's got to love me. He said he would love me, and he's putting up with me. He doesn't like me. He doesn't enjoy me. This verse says to me, he will take great, great delight in you. Have you ever noticed how a four-year-old comes to you 
after they've drawn a picture, and they're so proud of it. You ever, you ever notice that, how that goes? You know, they come and say, look at, look at this. Look, look, what, look what I drew. Look at this. And you take it, and you, and you turn around. And you kiss. No, it's this way. Okay, oh, oh, but of course, yes. What is it? Well, it's you and mommy, see? And, and there's my ugly sister. And they make her really ugly, you know? And uh, I say, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, that's, that's really good. Why are they so delighted about that? I'll tell you why. I, I oil paint. It's something I've acquired since I left here and in my spare time, sometimes alone late at night. I have a place where I go and I oil paint. And I like to every now and then show what I painted to my wife. It's an expression of me. It's an expression of, of my ingenuity. It, it comes from me, my inspiration. That little four-year-old is saying, this is from me. I made this. I created this. And that's the way God looks at you. He created you. And you're an expression of his creativity. You're, his image is on you. He looks at you with great delight and just, wow, look at you. You know, now you may feel like you got this big old schnoz, you don't like it, or you don't like your height, or you don't like your intelligence level. Last hour I said to that, I said schnoz and I looked around, and I thought, is there anybody here who's Italian that's got a big whopper of a nose? There's nobody here. So I think we're good. I think I'm safe here again this morning. You're a bunch of Dutchmen, but whatever. Um, God created you with all the things that you may call it a shortcoming, but he made it that way. As a matter of fact, it's a good lesson to us when we start to criticize the way somebody looks, that God created that. Yeah. God created you, and he's delighted in you. In fact, I, I can't prove this theologically, and I certainly can't put a Bible verse to it, but I every now and then just picture God saying to the heavenly host, hey, everybody, here, hey, look at this. Look at Barbara's doing down here. Look at, look at Bill's doing here. Look at how he's taking those talents I gave him and all the creative things he's doing with that. Wow, I just thrill in that. I think God the Father looks at us like that. But most people don't feel like he looks at them like that. But he does. He looks at your blonde hair and says, wow, golden, it's beautiful. Wow, I like the way I created you. I really do. Wow. He looks at me and, and he says, I like your male pattern baldness, you know? <laughs> wow. God likes that. I turned you white. How do you like that, Doug? You can't stop it. Lady Claire all might help, but I didn't do that. But anyway, determined I wouldn't. God delights in us. God likes us. God celebrates us. Listen to me very closely here, though. Most of the people that you run into don't believe that. Most of the people you run into, they feel some sort of judgment from God. Rarely do they feel that God looks at them with any kind of appreciation. I do a lot of funerals. I've done 12 this year since January. I did 27 funerals last year. A lot of death out there. Funeral home has me come and do these funerals, and, and the deal I have with them is, look, I'll be glad to, and they had me do the unchurched people. <laughs> they said, you wear well with the unchurched. I said, what does that say about my spirituality, you know? <laughs> but whatever. They used me for that. I said, well, here's the deal. I will do the funerals, but, but um, I will never do a funeral and not give the gospel. I will always, always give the gospel. Now, if you ever get a person who says, we don't want any of that God stuff, well, then get yourself another boy. I'm not the man for that funeral, but I'll, I'll do any funeral that anybody who's not a, obstreperous about that, I'll go ahead and, and share with them the gospel of Jesus and the time with the family beforehand is really valuable, and there's some great moments there. But I got to tell you, um, when I talk in a funeral to people who are non-churched, about the fact that God loves them. By the way, I'll never preach their relative into heaven. If the guy is a total unbeliever and he shook his face or fist in the face of God, I'm not going to say, and oh, he's in a much better place. No, 
I can't with integrity do that. But I will talk about the fact that God loved your father. And God loves you. And he delights in you. Well, we got to move on. Third thing. It says, he will quiet you with his love. You know what I picture? Any of you ever have an inconsolable baby that you just couldn't get it to quit crying? You know what that's like? And you're walking the floor back and forth like this. Shh, shh, come on, hush, baby, hush. And a mother pulls that baby into her breasts and holds it gently and quietly and, and hushes the baby. And, and then the baby has peace and goes to sleep. This verse is saying that he will minister peace to you. That's really what that's saying. He will quiet you with his love. Yesterday morning at 8 o'clock, I was in Mercy Hospital with a guy. Actually, he's my secretary's husband. She was my secretary for 20 of the 21 years I was in Spring Lake, and her husband, he was a CEO, Christmas, Easter only type guy, you know? Um, he uh, just didn't do church at all. And so the doctor the other day told him that uh, this pressure you've been feeling on your stomach and your esophagus is because you have a mass. You have a major mass over here and a small cell carcinoma. You have seven to 12 months to live. Get your house in order. Wow. Scared to death. He said to his wife, he said, hey, I need to talk to Pastor Doug about dying with that prognosis. And so I was there with him Thursday, and we talked, and doctors were in and out, and his wife was there, and, and everybody's pretty weepy and, and pretty devastated over this news. And, and uh, I said, okay, um, you know, you would like to have this conversation. This is not going to work here, but let me tell you something. I'm going to be here tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I said to his wife, don't come in until 9. Leave me alone with him at 8 o'clock. And Mike, we're going to talk about death, we're going to talk about Jesus. We're going to talk about eternal life. And he said, yes, I want that. And this guy is almost shaking. He is so scared with the news he's been given. Now, to give you an idea what this guy is like, he's about 280 pounds. He's a trucker. He is one of these guys with a lot of rough edges and a lot of rough language. And he's been a really rough liver. And, uh, and so, you know, you know, the idea of talking about spiritual things, but here he is. He is saying, I want to have that conversation. I really do. So yesterday morning at 8 o'clock, I'm there, and I said, well, you know, Mike, you know, the stats are you're going to die. I said, there's exceptions to that, and we hope there's an exception, and uh, there's a, you know, that verse that says you have not because you ask not, um, you know, and I always say, never let it be said that I didn't ask, so we're going to ask for your healing. We'll pray for that. But statistically speaking, humanly speaking, a year from now, you're probably not going to be here. So let's talk about your spiritual journey. Tell me about, about your faith. He said, well, I have faith. I really do. I said, okay, tell me about it. Where did it start? He said, well, you know, I believe in God, and I, and I believe in Jesus, and I believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I said, well, great. I said, you're up to speed with Satan now. He believes that. He believes it far more than any one of us do here today. He looked rather disappointed with my response. I said, but he's not going to be in heaven while believing all that. I said, let me tell you something. It's all about a relationship with Jesus. Well, then we went into that. And happily, he prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to be his Savior and invite him into his heart and life. And, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, it was a great time with him. But here's, here's the thing that was so fun. When I walked into that room, and this is not any kind of kudo to my uh, counseling techniques. I'm not a great counselor, I don't think. It's, it's kudos to God that when I walked in there, he was like an inconsolable baby, scared and shaking at 8 o'clock Friday morning. When I walked out of there, he's smiling. He said, okay, I'm ready now. For whatever happens, I'm, I'm good. You know what he's feeling? He's feeling the ministry of the Holy Spirit quieting him with God's love. He's feeling the love. Ah, yeah. 
I know that I'm going to heaven. It's going to be okay. Um, and he said, oh, by the way, I, I, I want to... I want to hear about heaven. What, what does that look like? I've never really thought much about it. So I took him to Revelation chapter 20 and 21. We talked about the fact that it never ends and, and there's no dying, there's no sickness, there's no pain or anything like that. We're going on and on. He said, man, it really sounds like a great place. I said, oh, I believe it's going to be greater than great. I has not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who, who love him. And uh, I said, that's all waiting for you. I told him about my 94-year-old aunt, my 94-year-old aunt, who I shared that with her. And she sat up in bed. And she said, oh, that sounds so good. I want to go right now. And then she fell back and she said, but I'm so healthy. And I said, <laughs> I'm sorry, aunt, but you will die. And you'll die soon, really. You're not going to stay here much longer. She said, oh, good. I was with her a month later and she died. And, uh, and the nurse, she was crying. She said, I, I'm so sorry, sir. I said, oh, don't be sorry. She is just thrilled. And she and I together have been looking forward to this moment. She looked at me like I was from Venus or something. You're Mars. And, uh, and it was an opportunity once again to talk about this lady and her relationship to Jesus. Well, we've got to end with the last thing, and, and this is the most curious thing. I've never thought of God like this before I looked at this verse. Look at it. At the end of this verse, you know, he, he's with us. He delights in us. He quiets us with his love, and he rejoices over us with singing. The Lord of the universe, the creator of the universe, sings over me. Now, if he's going to sing over me, then the implication of that is he knows my name. Wow. He took little Dougie in his arms, and he, he's looking at Dougie now. He's, he's looking at me, and he's still singing over me. Wow. I see a lot of Q-tips out there. Not you white hairs, okay? So better known as baby boomers. I see you, Mike Pearson, smiling. You are a baby boomer par excellence, incarnate of what I'm talking about. And I'm a baby boomer. We were raised with those songs in the 60s and 70s where the guys would sing about a girl, and I was always singing her name, you know? G-L-O-R-I-A, Gloria, I'm going to shout on that, Gloria. Remember that? Well, maybe you don't. I don't know. You know, the Hollies, hey, Carrie Ann, what's your game now? Can anybody play? Remember that song? Brandy, Brandy. Yeah, Brandy. Yeah, there it is, Brandy, you know. And on and on it goes, help me, Rhonda. Where's Rhonda Hopkins? Help, help me, Rhonda. Oh, and for Becky Manzer, who is in the last hour, Peggy Sue, Peggy Sue, pretty, 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 pretty Peggy Sue. They're always singing about a girl. Why? Because they love that girl. They know her name, and they're singing her name. Think of your heavenly Father who knows you by name and sings over you. Now, that's astounding for me. I have a friend who's a surgeon, and every now and then he'll ask me to come and photograph surgical things he's doing so he can teach it. He knows I have interest in that type of thing. So I've been through many surgeries and watched people opened up in, in amazing ways, all filleted before me. And I look inside that body, and I think, this is just amazing. Wow. The creator of all this that makes all this work, he sings over me. I look at the trees and the grass and animals, and, and I think, that creator of all that, that sovereign Lord of the universe, he sings over me. Wow. Well, I guess he does love me. I guess he is quite delighted in me. Wow. Well, <laughs> go back to Psalm 107. We've got to end here, okay? Psalm 107. I said that there's consequences for our sin. And I want to ask you this morning, in light of Psalm 107 here, where are you in that whole scenario? And I want you to ask yourself that. 
Am I one of those that's so wandered from God that I'm like one of those sailors on a merchant ship that's reeling to and fro? I, my life is a mess. I don't know where I'm going. I've so defected from God. Is that you? Or are you aware of it? You're so aware of it that now you're, you find yourself crying out to God and things are not changing. Or maybe you have cried out and God has redeemed you and restored you and life is going well. I have a word for each one of those things. If you're one of those that's wandering today, and you say, well, I'm in church, aren't I? I'm hardly a wanderer, you know. Oh, you can be in church and wander. <laughs> I said to Mike, he said, you know, Doug, I, I haven't gone to church all those years. That you know." And he's so taken with all his sin and the terrible disappointment that he is to God. And, uh, and I said, let me tell you a secret, Mike, from a guy who's a retired pastor. After all those years of pastoring people, let me tell you something that I know. And that, that there's a whole bunch of people that go to church every Sunday that'll end up in hell. Really? I said, yeah, man. There's a lot of good people going to hell and a lot of bad people are going to heaven because it's Jesus. He stood in the gap. If it weren't for Jesus, man, we'd, we'd all be sunken ships. So if you're there and you're crying out, if that's you this morning, you're, you're crying out, I want you to know he, he never left you, and he wants to redeem you. You say, well, I'm already saved. That's, that's fine. So then there needs to be that time of just reconnecting with Jesus, saying, all right, I'm back. I'm back. I'm done. You know, God has a way of just bringing a stop into people's lives. I may have said something about this last time I was here. I don't know. I had a heart attack two years ago crazy thing that I would have a heart attack. I just can't believe it yet. Anyway, I'm pulling my kayaks across the front lawn to load them up and take them to the Straits of Mackinac. My wife and I like to kayak across the Straits. Every once in a while, we enjoy that kind of thing. And, uh, and I'm going across the front lawn, and all of a sudden, I feel these chest pains, and I thought, oh, this isn't good. And I dropped the kayaks, and I walked into the house, and I said, I got a problem. And my wife said, yeah, you do, because I was looking pretty ashen. The rest is history. I go to the hospital, they put a couple stint or put a stint in me, and you know, it's all good. Yeah. So three days later, Kay's driving, and we drive up our driveway. And as we drive up the driveway, I look at those kayaks on the front lawn, still laying there, right where I dropped them. I thought, man, I had plans. And it stopped right there. God put a big stop in my life. No farther, Doug. I got something I want to say to you. And he did have some things to say to me. I said to Mike, who's got a trucking business, he's doing great, going here, going there, he's excited about life, and all of a sudden, God gives him this terrible word that you've got 12 to, or 7 to 12 months. It's called a big divine stop. And maybe you're here today, and maybe this message is just that divine stop for you, where you just are saying, okay, I'm done running, and I'm back, God. And if you have been restored, you are a believer. You are a follower of Christ. And, you, and you've come back and come back and come back and keep coming back. That's good. And, and now what should you do? Well, what you should do is what verse 8 says here. Look at verse 8 in here. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. I'm always amazed just amazed at the fact that God does such great things for us and we seem to fail to stop and say thank you. How many times have you wheeled into the presence of God? Just wheeled into his presence without praising him first. I always have a couple guys I'm discipling. I think God has called all of us to disciple people. And, uh, and one of the things I like to teach guys I'm discipling is how to pray. And uh, a pattern for praying that I always bring up is the Acts pattern. You probably taught your kids that. A-C-T-S. Adoration. You start with adoring him. Then you go to confession of your sins. Then you go to thanking him for all the things he's done for you and who he is and, and on and on. And the last thing is supplication. Supplication is just, that's where you're asking. 
stuff of God. Usually, we're right there saying, oh God, help me, we got this situation, I need, you know, and, and we start there. Start with adoration. My wife said every now and then she disciplines herself in her prayer life, and my wife is an intercessor by trade. That's what she does. She runs prayer events, and her life is just one prayer event after another. And she said, I have told some of my people in some of my events, take a day where you just take a moratorium from anything but just adoring him, just adoring Jesus, loving him, praising him. Start with that. Do that sometime. So, as I close, and it is now 1145, this is a stellar moment for me. I've never ended on time. And don't tell anybody it happened or else it'll ruin my image. But anyway, as I close, please, please understand God likes you. He loves you. He really delights in you. And he is really wanting to enjoy you. He's all about that. Hold on to that, would you? Father in heaven, I do thank you for loving me, for liking me, and I can just catalog my sins before you, and I, I am grieved about my own shortcomings, and yet you look down from glory and just are delighted with me. That's just beyond my comprehension, but I take it in faith, believing, because your word says it. And so, Lord, I pray for each person here today that they'll take these words to heart and that they'll feel better about themselves. It's not a power of positive thinking thing at all. It's the power of understanding who you as the sovereign Lord really are like and what your character is. And your character is one of love and tenderness and faithfulness to us. Thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And now I just want to say thank you.